I had a seventh. You have to remember. Good afternoon. I just want to say a quick thank you to Dr. Edwards for inviting me here today. And a thank you for all of you coming to listen to my story. It's not very often that a patient gets the opportunity to bring something off of a page, or I guess now in this technology, off of a laptop, and explain a diagnosis and make it real, and show you that there's a person behind a diagnosis. And I can tell you for sure, it's not very often that a patient has the opportunity to educate doctors who will be taking care of her in the future, or maybe even diagnosing a patient of your own. It sounds like you've already started to cover a little bit about pemphigus and pemphigoid. Um, pemphigus, as you know, is an autoimmune disease where my body thinks that the cells that hold my skin together, the desmoglians, are foreign and must be attacked and conquered. Contrary to what my mother believes from her vast education from watching the doctors, it's not because I had mono when I was in college or I've traveled on international mission trips to South America. And I don't want to go against my aunt either, but it's not because my immune system is weak. Actually, it's quite the opposite. My immune system is bored, and now it's making stuff up. To tell you a little bit about myself, I am 36 years old now. I was about 32, 33 when I was first started to get my first symptoms, married to my husband of four years now, a very good U of M grad himself. I got a nursing degree from Western Michigan University in 1999 and started my career at a children's hospital down in Detroit. I know it's that other one, downtown Detroit. Um, I worked on a unit that was half neurosurge, half endocrine before moving to the OR, and about eight years ago now, um, I started at an outpatient surgery center closer to my home where I scrub and circulate endo cases, circulate OR cases, order the drugs for our entire surgery center, and precept a high school consortium program for kids that want to go into the healthcare field. Back to my story. I was diagnosed with pemphigus on February 16th of 2010, and I just kind of want to give you a timeline leading up to the events of my diagnosis. In September of 2008, I was diagnosed with an anal fissure. I went to my gastroenterologist, and he gave me a treatment called anal pram. He said, trust me, this cures about 96% of my patients. And when that didn't work, he gave me another ointment, nitroglycerin ointment, which really did nothing except for give me excruciating headaches. I was under a lot of stress at this time and just thought it was because of the stress and my unusual diet. I was planning my own wedding for February or January rather of 2009. I was also the maid of honor in my friend's wedding. She had just had major surgery for an aortic aneurysm, and he was just diagnosed with Guillain-Barre syndrome. So I was doing a lot to try and help them. And we were also renovating the only full bathroom in our house. During that time, I had moved back to my parents' house and let my husband live in the middle of the reno mess. I figured all of this was just attributing to the stress level. And I explained my weird nosebleeds away because I had really bad allergies. And while I was at it, I was, like I said, I wasn't eating the best diet. And salsa is one of my comfort foods. It's like Frank's, I put it on everything. And so I was eating a lot of salsa. So I figured the water blisters in my mouth that didn't really hurt and I could just run my tongue over and they'd go away was because of that. Well, in January, I got married on a very cold, minus 15 degree day, and we got eight inches of snow in our reception alone, right? My husband took me on a fabulous honeymoon to Antigua, and of course, we were eating lots of fresh fruit, pineapple, papaya, mango, a lot of acidic fruits, and I started to get the worst canker sores I've ever had in my life, or so I thought. I thought this was just because I was eating all this fruit and of course, drinking all those pretty drinks with the umbrellas in them at the resort, but it wasn't the case. They eventually went away, and I thought it was just because we came home from our honeymoon. By September of 2009, a year after this adventure started, not only did I have one anal fissure that wouldn't heal, now I had three. I literally felt like I was ripping myself in half every time I went to the bathroom, and thanks to Pemphigus, I'd find out that's actually what I was doing. I had nosebleeds that happened all summer and fall and spring, and really without any inf reason for it. I was fighting my best against my allergies and my nose was actually hurting on the inside now. Those water blisters that I had a year ago had suddenly come back too. And I could scrape my tongue across them and again they would go away. But now they just moved to another part of my mouth and they became more and more painful, eventually leading to these large canker sores that never really went away. 
In October of 2009, it was time for my six month checkup with my dentist. And like a good patient, I kept that appointment. And about that time, I was starting to get Invisaligns. You'll see the picture up there is from my first appointment. You can see um, some of the lesions that I started to have on my mouth, around my gums. I explained to my dentist that these canker sores were large, and painful, and never really went away. I told her it was easy to rip the scabs off of them, and sometimes that made it better, for a little bit at least. I also told her it was very hard to brush, and my mouth just felt slimy all the time. She told me, you have bad oral hygiene and you need to learn to brush more. So of course I did. At this time, she also told me I needed to use Amosan, a debriding mouthwash, and that should help clear everything up. I would use this mouthwash and let me tell you, it was kind of like my kryptonite, broke me down to nothing. It wasn't really making anything better, so by November, I started to consult another doctor, as my husband calls it, Dr. Google. I started to look on the internet and trying to find something associated with a GI tract. After all, I was having problems down here and now I was having lesions here. And I decided I had Crohn's and so I made an appointment with my gastroenterologist again. And that's when he told me he pretty much thought I came to him for a second opinion. Well, we talked about what was going on and he said, well, can you have a look? And he looked inside of my mouth and he cringed and went, ooh. And let me tell you, if you can make a gastroenterologist gross out, you really are somebody, right? <laughs> By the way, fun fact about my GI guy, he was considered getting into dentistry and was actually accepted to the program and decided he thought it would be gross to have his, people's, or his hands in people's mouths all day. <laughs> yeah, told me this while he was doing a rectal exam in the OR. <laughs> so, <laughs> Anyway, back to my appointment. Uh, he called in his physician assistant at that time, and I really kind of thought that was a little backwards, but okay, baby cakes, anybody that can help me come on in, right? And it turns out she used to be a dental hygienist. And so she too wanted to look into my mouth after hearing the story and thought, ooh, when she looked into my mouth, another one to gross out, right? Well, the two of them decided to call her former employer a dentist. And together they decided to prescribe me a Decadron mouthwash. It had about 10 milligrams of Decadron in the whole bottle, as well as a little Maalox in it to help it stick to the lesions. I have to tell you, it really was a godsend. It made my mouth so much better. It made it so much better, but I ran out before it went away. And when I stopped using the mouthwash, it was like I made it angry, and it came back with a vengeance. My thought of having crows, Crohn's also must not have been too far off the mark because he signed me up for a colonoscopy for that, November, that December. Things progressively kept getting a little bit worse and worse as time went on, and by Thanksgiving, I decided the best way to handle dinner, Thanksgiving dinner, was to go into the bathroom and scrape the scabs off my mouth. Um, it, my mouth was very tight, and any time I tried to move it, it would bleed, so I thought this is a way to survive dinner. And when I sat down to dinner, most of you would laugh when I tell you I maybe had two bites of meat on my plate, maybe a tablespoon of corn, and two tablespoons of mashed potatoes. After I got the bleeding to stop in the bathroom, I went downstairs to eat, and we sat down to dinner, and by my second bite, the mashed potatoes on my fork were red. I just gave up at that point. My family was continually telling me that this isn't right, that this is wrong. You have to talk to somebody. And I kept telling them I was. I talked to my dentist. I have these stupid Invisaligns and have to show up there all the time, right? Nobody would believe me. And so pretty much to get them off my back, I made an appointment with my internist. It was when I went in and I explained everything. I figured I had to be honest about everything. The mono in college, my immune system maybe. Talked about mission trips and renovating the house. Pretty much gave him more information than he ever wanted. He looked in my mouth and, attend, and again went, <sighs> that's when he told me I had some pretty bad canker sores and that they would go away in two weeks if we treated them, 14 days if we did nothing. <laughs> nice, huh? <laughs> and so I told him, like, I get it, but the problem is, is I've had these sores since September and they haven't gone away yet. I explained about the Decadron mouthwash and said that, you know, I only took it for seven days. I swished and spit just like they told me to. But I think if I could take it for maybe 10 days, 
or maybe even two weeks, things would get a lot better. He told me he didn't think so because if it didn't go away in seven days, it probably wouldn't do it. So I left with nothing. In December, my mouth was worse yet again. Now I had multiple lesions on my gums, my cheeks, and even my tongue. I talked to my dentist about refilling that Decadron mouthwash, and she said she didn't want to because that was way too much steroid to be on. Instead, she decided to prescribe an alcohol-based PerioGuard <laughs> and told me to, that she didn't know if it was help, but it sure wouldn't make things worse. By the way, you need to brush more. I cried every time I used that godforsaken perio guard. I would literally bang my feet on the floor and cry and bang my fists on the counter. The first time I did it, my husband thought I was, something was really wrong. By this point, I wasn't able to turn on my electric toothbrush. And this is about the time when I learned to swallow meat whole. And I only did it when I had to eat it. Pasta became a favorite meal of mine. But soon, that would turn into sandpaper in my mouth as well. Oh yeah, and I started babying my mouth. I didn't talk like this back then. Instead, I talked more like this. It was kind of hard to understand me, but at least it wasn't ripping the scabs open in my mouth. I pretty much had a complete loss of appetite by the end of the month, and a simple meal like a small Wendy's chili would take me over an hour to eat. Besides for my current problems, the skin on my external genitalia started sloughing off. I would explain to my husband that I didn't want to be intimate because I was tired, because he looked tired, because it was a long day. Tomorrow was going to be a long day. It was too late. It was too early. Whatever excuse was. Remember, this was my first year of marriage. So you can imagine how emotionally trying this was for the both of us. Again, I consulted my friend Dr. Google on the internet, and this time my husband started to join me. We started to try and find pictures of what my mouth looked like compared to what pictures on the internet looked like. And together we came up with a working list of about six things. But secretly on my list, I had a seventh. You have to remember, I'm a health care provider, right? And every one of us in this room as a health care provider runs the risk of getting stuck by a needle. And that happened to me about 10 years ago. I had gone through the testing, the patient had gone through all the testing and all that stuff, and everybody came back negative. But what if it was too early for my little kiddo to have been diagnosed yet? What if her antibody levels weren't that high? In the meantime, with all of these thoughts running through my head, my gastroenterologist contacted me. After all, I worked with him three days a week at the surgery center. And he said, you know, there's an off-label uh, use for a drug called Botox. And I was thinking about these anal fissures. What do you say we inject your largest fissure with 40 milligrams of Botox on either side? This would end up paralyzing my sphincter, but at least it would give that muscle a chance to heal, right? Because these fissures were so bad. He was going to invite a very uh, respected uh, general surgeon who happened to be the chief of trauma at our, at our hospital. And he would be in there as well. And I thought, OK, this isn't really sounding real good, but if this is what it's going to take, it's what it's going to take. Injecting that fissure, or the, the sphincter rather, resulted in an obvious loss of bowel control. And so now I had sores down here, sores up here, and I was wearing a diaper whenever I left the house and there wasn't a bathroom ready available, including to work. This was exceptionally emotionally trying, but I thought it had to be done. By the way, the biopsies for the colonoscopy, surprise, surprise, came back negative for um, any type of acute or chronic colitis. January 2010. Now I'm back at my dentist, my favorite dentist at this point, for my uh, Invisaligns. I told her my mouth is falling apart. My life is falling apart. I said I needed that Decadron mouthwash. I really, really think, and just to prescribe it to me, just to prove that I'm wrong. And she did. That's when she told me she thought whatever was going on was idiopathic and I would just have to learn to live with it. Water would sting. Yogurt was way too clingy. Even potato, or potatoes, whipped potatoes, and bananas were too acidic. You're getting the point of what I'm eating? By this point, I'm pretty much surviving on water and Slurpees. And I think the Slurpees made it cold and would kind of numb it for a little bit. 
By the way, by this point, I had lost about 15 to 20 pounds since the fall. January, if you remember, is also when I got married. So this was the time of my first anniversary. And my husband planned a fabulous weekend for us, including taking me out to dinner to the nice restaurant that we had dreamed about going to. When we got seated at our table, the waitress asked us what we wanted to drink. And I thought, drink, yeah, a glass of wine. It's like pouring alcohol on this, because that's what it is, right? So then I thought, well, maybe I would have a glass of ginger ale with a lime. And I thought, no, the, the lime is too acidic, and that carbonation would just rip the skin out of my mouth. So I went back to Old Faithful, and I ordered a glass of water. And the waitress went, water? Most people order drinks here. So well, I understand but I would like a large glass of water. And her definition of large is a little different than my definition of large because she brought me about four ounces of water. I would need an entire glass of water to get through one bite. And my husband ended up offering me his multiple times throughout the meal. By my third or fourth bite, I was crying. You only get one first anniversary, and this is mine, and I ruined it for the both of us. After that, I pretty much cried all the time that I wasn't at church or work. I cried when I showered. I cried when I went to the bathroom when I was cooking a meal because I'd have to eat. I'd cry when I was eating, and I'd cry when I was doing the dishes because I ruined dinner for the both of us yet again. I cried when I walked. I cried when I talked. You get the picture, right? Finally, one night, my husband came home from work. I had been extremely tired since all of this had been going on and just thought it was a lot of stress at work. And he asked me what I wanted. And I said, I just wanted a bowl of whipped potatoes. And, I, and he said, OK, I'll make some mashed potatoes. I said, no, I want whipped potatoes. And if you can make them almost the consistency of milk, I'd be really satisfied with that. And he did. And when I went to the table to eat, I sat down and I took my first spoon. And skin from my lips stuck to the bottom of the spoon. And blood was oozing out of my mouth at this point. Again, I started crying something new and different for my husband, right? And I just said, I can't do this. And I went upstairs to bed. That was the night my husband pretty much had had enough. It was also the night that my life would start to turn around. You see, the next day, he called his internist. And he ended up talking to a really nice nurse named Becky. Explained everything that I had been through, all these sores in my mouth, and how nobody could give me an answer. That nice nurse named Becky took sympathy on this nice nurse named Becky and made me a Saturday appointment when they didn't make Saturday appointments. I got ecstatic that I was actually going to go, and somebody might actually listen and help me, that I took a six-page history of everything that I possibly thought could be related and to give to her on my history and physical. By the end of the appointment, she had asked a lot of questions and taken a lot of notes. And I just needed to thank her, because for the first time, I felt like somebody actually listened to me. And that above a diagnosis was more important than anything, because up till this point, people thought they had answers and just kind of brushed me off. She was the first person who told me, I don't know. And re amazingly, that was great. That was OK. She also told me that she loved a good mystery and it was up for an excellent challenge. She sent me to the lab with a lab slip, and I had no idea what I was getting myself in for because they took about 15 vials of blood for me, and I thought I was going to need a transfusion from my blood draw. Um, when the results came back, my lab work was pretty much normal across the board. There was one type of white cell. I think it was my eosinophils that were a little high, but my ANA, the test that they test for rheumatoid, was sky off the wall. She thought I had Bichette syndrome. And that was one of the things my husband and I considered, too. But there was really nothing wrong with my eyes at that time. And she said that these eye lesions, the mouth lesions, and didn't really fit. So she asked if I'd be willing to make an appointment with the oral surgeon just to have this checked out. She didn't think it was related. By early February, I've told you a lot of the problems I'd been having. But then I also started to get these water blisters on my chest. A lot of them happened kind of here, like underneath my breast. And our heat in our building sometimes went on the fritz. And it had been all very hot lately, and we'd been very busy. So I thought it was just a folliculitis. Um, I should have probably known as a nurse because it didn't look like folliculitis, and I could scrape the thing off of it, the skin off of it, pretty easily. 
Um, also, the skin on my internal and external genitalia started sloughing off, and I still haven't seen any relief at all from my anal sphincter. So I made the appointment and kept the appointment for January, or February 3rd, rather, excuse me, in the Department of Hospital Dentistry and Oral Surgery. I, they took me to a room, there was a lot of equipment, and a nice resident came in. I handed him the same stack of paper that I gave to my internal medicine doctor, but now I've added what she's told me to it. He said, okay, thank you, and left me sitting there for a few more minutes and went out and came back in with his attending and about seven other med students and residents behind them. The attending came in and introduced himself, shook my hand, put a pair of gloves on, and promptly grabbed the side of my mouth. And when he did, his finger slipped and he took off of, uh, some skin, probably from my first knuckle to the tip of my finger. And of course, it started bleeding right away. He apologized, and you know, that was kind of something I felt was common that happened here. He apologized and went on and looked in my mouth, and then seven other people were looking and squirming when they would look in my mouth as well. The group left, and obviously they were talking about me out in the hallway because the resident came in, and he told me that he and the attending had narrowed it down to a list of three things. On my way out, if I could schedule an appointment with um, with the clinic again, and they would do a biopsy, that would be great. And I'm not gonna lie, this is the moment I lost my last mind, my mind. I kind of went crazy, and I'm not gonna lie. I started crying immediately, and I told them that I can't do this. I can't walk out of here today without an answer. They have to do something. This is why I came here. I even went a little step further, and I grabbed him by his white lab coat. <laughs> As a nurse, I know better, right? Like. Like, your lab coat is like your lab coat. And as a grown-up, I know that you do not lay your hands on another person. And I told him I was so desperate, I didn't know how long I could go on with this. And then I grabbed my purse and started throwing credit cards at him. And I told him that he had to do this biopsy today. And I had my checkbook and whipped that out in my wallet. And I told him, I will pay you cash. Like, you just have to do this today. Nobody has to know, but please, please do this today. And he agreed. He ended up taking three biopsies from different parts of my mouth. And he was talking the whole time, and I didn't really care because it kind of hurt, and I just wanted some answers. And one of the things he mentioned was that they were going to send it for an um, immunofluorescent test. Didn't really know what that was, didn't really care. And as he was sewing up my mouth from those biopsies with suture, my mouth was so friable that more often than not, the suture would pull through my skin. A week later, I made a follow-up appointment to get the biopsy results. And that's when they told me that immunofluorescent test, my cells lined up like tombstones. And that was pretty indicative, like the diagnostic test for Pempigus vulgaris. I didn't really know what that meant, but they scheduled me an appointment for a couple days later with Dr. Murdoch Kinch. And I knew it couldn't be good if I could get in that quick with a new doctor. So when I went to talk to her, she talked to me about what to do and treatments and she also wanted me to see a dermatologist in the derm clinic and referred me to Dr. DeLugos. I didn't really understand this because the problem was mainly in my mouth and a few other places. Why in the heck would I need to see a dermatologist? But let's get everybody on board that we possibly can, right? February 16th, 2010, in my appointment at the dermatologist, I had the most complete physical exam ever given by anybody, let alone a dermatologist, two residents, three med students. And I was actually kind of surprised that day that I didn't get a pap smear. <laughs> they explained a little bit about Pemphigus vulgaris and again about how my body is fighting itself. And they put me on 80 milligrams of prednisone and uh, three grams of Celsept a day. What they didn't tell me it was about all the side effects of these drugs. And some are vicious. As it turns out, a year after this, as a side note, because of the prednisone, I went from bone density being in the 98th percentile for my age to being osteopenic. They also didn't tell me about the moon face that I would get to the point where I wouldn't even recognize myself, and I started eating and putting on weight like crazy. And talking about crazy, I started acting really crazy. I stopped sleeping for the most part. I had the cleanest house, because that's when I, at night, when my husband was sleeping, I would do my best cleaning, washing, drying, it didn't really matter. Oh, and I ordered a lot from QVC. 
I started talking really fast and pretty much nonstop almost all the time. I mean, you think I'm talking fast today, but this is nothing, right? And my husband eventually told me I sounded like the guy from the Hot Wheels commercials when we were kids. <laughs> nice, huh? <laughs> um, on my way to and from appointments at U of M, in the dermatology and the oral surgery clinic, I would call and cry and talk to anybody and tell them how hungry I was, and I would give any money if I could just figure out a way to eat my arm. It was about this time, too, that my husband started sleeping with his hand over his head because he was afraid I was going to smother him in his sleep. I would tell him multiple times, and I'm very sorry about this, but I used to tell him, you're going to do nothing right today. I know that, and you need to know it, too. And I meant it. I pretty much hit my pinnacle when one day he came home and I had a belt sander in our bay window because I decided I didn't like the color of the stain anymore and I was in a cloud of dust. I would say maybe two or three weeks after I was diagnosed and all this stuff started happening and all these changes started to occur, I called my doctor back in the derm clinic and asked him, hey, like the, I understand that this isn't very common, but there's got to be a support group for people like me. And that's when he told me he didn't have any idea of a group. He told me that this is very rare and this is like winning the lottery. This is not like winning the lottery, <laughs> trust me. Um, so I went back to the internet and started investigating that again as well, trying to find a support group. If he didn't know, there's got to be one out there and gosh darn it, I was going to find it. And that's when I stumbled across the International Pemphigus and Pemphigoid Foundation. Uh, Pemphigus.org is their website if you're ever interested in looking at it. It is a phenomenal place to recommend to patients. They have forums and talk groups about treatments and lifestyle and changes and even for family members. Most importantly for me, they have peer coaches. It's somebody who's been diagnosed with this disease and that they kind of walk and talk you through it and you realize that you're not by yourself in this like I felt all along. She also gave me some diet tips, recommended that I keep a food journal to see what was setting up my, my uh, lesions off, and warned me about even more future effects of the drugs. Everything seemed to be going okay until March, and I developed this weird wheeze in my lung. They had been monitoring my blood all along and watching my white count, but nothing really ever popped up out of the norm. And this wheeze kind of scared them because I was already on 80 milligrams of prednisone. And that's the medicine, which is way above the, the respiratory dose that they would give you if you had um, any kind of wheeze or lung problems. And it wasn't real responsive to any sort of treatment or inhaler or anything. Even this, I didn't really mind because the first time, this for the first time in a few months, um, my mouth lesions weren't getting any worse. They weren't getting better yet, but they weren't getting worse. Oh, and by this time, thanks to the steroids, my blood pressure had gone up. So as if I wasn't already taking a mouthful of pills, now I added a beta blocker to the, to the mix. In May, I went to an annual patient and doctor meeting that they have um, with the IPPF. And it's a chance for people who kind of lead um, our lead researchher's in this from Johns Hopkins, NYU, Stanford, University of Maryland, um, Case Western. And it's a place that you can go and get lectures and hear lectures on pemphigus and ways to deal with it and live with it. It's also um, a place that you can uh, network with other patients with pemphigus. That's when I found out I kind of did win the lotto. Pemphigus is a 1 in 200,000 chance of develop, you have a 1 in 200,000 chance of developing it. And I have about a 1 in 65,000 chance of passing it on if my husband and I ever have kids. I learned that most patients go undiagnosed for an average of six to nine months, a little bit shorter than me, but still, that's a long time when you're suffering. And I was so angry with all my doctors for mismanaging me and mistreating me, especially my dentist. I learned at that first meeting that if I had been left undiagnosed for three years, I had a 95% chance of mortality. You know what that means? Wouldn't be standing here before you today. The five-year mortality rate was 98%. I also went to some good seminars to learn how to deal with, with what was going on and how to cope with it. I learned that I shouldn't be 
taking showers, that the water was too rough on my skin, and I should be taking baths. I learned that I should be using gel soap instead of bar soap because it's not as harsh on my skin. And here's a weird one for you, but it actually worked. I learned that I needed to get a watering can with a long spot on it and keep it on the, in my bathroom and pour water over myself when I urinated to dilute the uric acid. That one worked the best for me. I was also told to eat more protein so my medicines would work better and reduce my uh, um, exposure to foods like with tannins in them, my beloved salsa with the onions and the tomatoes, no chocolate, no tea. Most importantly, reduce my stress. I'm really listening to that one, aren't I? I learned that most of us were really tired until we were diagnosed. I also learned that a lot of us had bad allergies and our symptoms started in the fall. I don't know if there's any uh, coincidence there, but it's just a little fun fact, I guess. By the way, that May, my anal fissures that I was having, I got finally released from my GI care because it turned out those weren't anal fissures at all. Those were actually three really bad pemphigus lesions that were finally starting to respond to treatment. The summer of 2010 was pretty uneventful, and they started to drop my steroid dose. Yay! Um, I got down to about 10 milligrams that summer before, um, before I started to develop mouth lesions again, and then I had a setback. They put me back up on 20 milligrams of prednisone, and that was a little bit of a, a tough spot for me. It was a definite mental setback, a definite physical setback, and I became so frustrated and thought I would never get rid of this. Oh, and did I mention that everybody in my circle of friends is either pregnant or having a baby? Everybody except for me, because you can't on these medications because they are so toxic to your body. Eventually, in late 2000, um, or I'm sorry, early 2011, I started weaning my prednisone. But my doctors didn't really want to touch my cell sept yet. Instead, because my husband and I wanted to have children, they put me on Imuran, which is another immunosuppressive drug, except my liver didn't like that at all. So they took, I had to kind of fight, I guess is the best way to put it, with my uh, dermatologist about getting off of treatment altogether. It had been about eight months since I had had a lesion in my mouth, and was I in a remission, or was I in a medical remission because everything had been so suppressed? And nobody could really answer me. I wanted to push it, and to this date, I still have a very firm agreement with my dermatologist. If I have any lesion in my mouth lasting longer than a week, or three lasting more than a few days, I need to call them and I need to get in. Back in 2010, too, Dr. Murdoch Kinch gave me a medicine called clobetasol. It's a topical ointment, and you're supposed to rub it in. It has the highest, I guess it has the highest amount of steroids for a topical medicine. She told me it may say for external use only, but go ahead and use it in your mouth. Well, when I got it, it had 1,009 stickers on it, warning, 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 warning. And if that doesn't freak you out, I don't know what will. And I still use that clobetasol sometimes today. Currently, and probably most devastating for you guys, I don't have very many lesions. I have a couple that are healing, and this is from my last, the picture on this side is from my last um, trip to the dentist. Um, I told her I had a few lesions in my mouth, and they weren't actually lesions yet. They were just kind of thinner areas in my mouth and that she needed to be gentle. I'm not on the cell sept or the prednisone anymore, and I don't talk as fast, and my husband no longer sleeps with his arm over his head, afraid I'm going to smother him in his sleep. Pregnancy is still a real issue for us. My eggs aren't getting any younger, and every day in the OR I expose myself to a little bit more radiation than the day before. My ANA is still quite high, and which means that my body is still busy trying to fight itself. So is that the reason why we're having trouble getting pregnant? I don't know. There's only been one study done out there, and it was a study of one woman in the Philippines, and she was able to have a baby, but it was kind of touch and go there for a while. Uh, besides for that, I'm not really sure what these medicines have done to me. Those immunosuppressives and the prednisone have not only robbed my body of the calcium that it so much really needed, but it also changes your DNA. And those changes might not show up for a while, and I've increased my risk of getting lymphoma because I've been on those drugs. I still have 55 pounds of steroid weight to lose, but at least I'm starting to lose it. 
And thanks to that weight gain, I now have plantar fasciitis, which is fun as an OR nurse. I'm not as angry at the doctors who first mistreated me. I guess the mistreated isn't even the right word to say it. They just didn't know. But I am still angry with my dentist because she doesn't take it easy on me. Even though I tell her you can't grab my mouth with a dry um, four by four, she still does. And at my last appointment, when my mouth was looking like this, she was still getting in there and digging, and I know I needed it. But it was only when I literally pushed her away and said, I need a break. You need to go deal with another patient and come back to me. And it was only then that she brought out the topical lidocaine ointment. And you think that this can't happen to you in your pra practice? Well, I'm telling you that you're wrong. Because my dentist used to be you. My dentist used to sit in these chairs. She, too, is a U of M grad. I learned through Pemphigus how strong I really am. I had to be my own advocate. And even when people told me that there was nothing wrong, that it was idiopathic, that I needed to brush more, that it could go away in two weeks if we do something, or 14 days if we don't, I knew something was wrong, and I fought for it. More importantly, I fought, fought my own worst, my, bleh. I fought my own worst enemy. I fought myself in my mind. I thought I was being wussy. As a healthcare professional, I learned the importance of a game face. Everybody who came near me or looked in my mouth would cringe when they looked at me. And I'm sure some of them thought that they were doing it and it would make me feel better. But it didn't. It made me feel gross and disgusting made me feel like a freak. Instead, I needed somebody to show me compassion, not only with their face, but with their actions. And I needed somebody to show me that they were listening to me, somebody other than my husband and my family. I also learned it is no fun being the most interesting case of the day. Everybody who came near me always wanted to look into my mouth, even though I told them that I had no lesions, or look at my chest, or look at some other area of my body. And then they would go and get more people, and then they would want to come in and look at me, to the point where I felt like, wow, just take a picture to last longer. You might not remember me after today. You probably don't even remember my name by this point. But I want you to remember that if you have a patient with pemphigus or any other oral lesion that is not going away, we're going to be your crazy people in your office. Okay? We're going to be the ones that are grabbing you by your coat, bringing you pages and pages of history that you don't even care anything about because we're so desperate to find answers. If you try and brush us off, we're going to be the ones that jump up and kind of block your way out of the door. We're going to talk nonstop and we're either going to talk to you or about you. And once the diagnosis comes up, you need to know you can't lie to me. Don't try and cover up. And I would much rather hear you say that I don't know, but I'll help you find an answer than to hear a lie. Because as a Pemphigus patient, I became the expert. Even after all this time, it's been about three years, a little over three years since my diagnosis, some people still don't believe it and think that I make this up because that's the thing with an autoimmune disease. You look normal on the outside. And I felt whiny because after all, I looked normal, I talked normal, I still went to work every day. I didn't want to feel wussy. And even when my lesions are gone, it's not really gone because I'm just waiting for my next lesion. When's it going to appear? What's going to be the thing to bring in? Things were so horrible during a period of my life that I didn't think I would ever find relief. I think I'm a really strong person, but I became very depressed. And believe it or not, I became very introverted as well. I don't think I could have made it through all of this without the support of my husband and my family. So that's pretty much my story. And now I've told you what I want you to know about Pemphigus. And so I think the only way to really learn is to ask questions. And I invite you to ask any question you want. There's really nothing off limit. Apparently, I'm pretty open with my life. And I'm willing to answer anything. Anything? Yes? Why do you Because of my Invisaligns. They are covered and under my insurance with her. 
and I have a lifetime maximum for, um, as many of you know with insurances and how that works, I have a, li um, a lifetime maximum of, for orthodontia. And so from now on, it's, I don't want to say it's free, but it's like all covered underneath that initial thing. And so until I'm done with them, I have to keep going back to her. Yes. If I could be, you're asking if I could be more understanding if she would give me a little, um, a little courtesy, I guess, or, right? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And that, that's more, most important, right? So as soon as I get done with these Invis Invisaligns, I already have another dentist lined up, which shouldn't be too far away. And so that's something as business owners you need to know, that, that you think I have to come to you, and I don't. And if I ask you or tell you that my mouth is really sore, I mean, it's not like I go in there and then it's like, boom, all of a sudden it's a surprise. Before, when she walks into the office and when she's putting her gloves on, I tell her, if you look over here and if you look over here, like these are sensitive areas. This is where I'm getting a lesion or where I'm getting, off, getting over one. So absolutely. Yes. Good question. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, how often do lesions show up for me? Um, for me, I have found a correlation between my monthly cycle. And so usually about once a month, I get a couple lesions here and maybe one over here. And I'll treat it topically with some clobetasol. Um, or sometimes do nothing at all, depending how I'm feeling. If, it's, if it feels bad, then sure, if, if I think it's going to get more severe, I'll treat it. Um, and a lot of the women that I have talked to through the IPPF have told me the same thing, that it is a, for them it's hormone-related. And along that same lines, just so you know, Pemphigus, um, at least the studies that they're doing through the IPPF, Pemphigus seems to be a women's disease about three to one. Yes, sure. Currently, um, he asked, "What drugs am I still uh, am I still taking?" Currently, I'm not taking anything. I'm completely off everything. Just using the topical clobetasol when I need it. Um, not really anything at all. I'm not on my blood pressure medicines anymore. Um, I don't, because of my problems with my liver, I'm very reluctant to even take a Tylenol. Um, if I'm, I guess the only thing I'm really taking is a calcium and vitamin D, and that's for my bones. Yes? Um, do you think your uh, uh, could have been initially treated with topical uh, steroids rather than just the same? Maybe, but if you have a lesion in your mouth, or in my case, like on my tush, my first instinct is not to go to a dermatologist. My instinct is to go to the person who specializes that. Um, somebody like a dentist or a periodontist, an ENT doctor even. Um, those are a couple people I asked my doctor if I should go to, and she told me no, that's idiopathic brush more. Um, maybe. Um, the only problem with where my first lesion was on my tush is that a topical steroid, as a lot of you know, will weaken the tissue. And that's kind of a high traffic area. So, so I don't know. I saw a hand over. Yes. Now that at least, well, I'm going to knock on something. But um, now they're all, the, she asked if I got lesions mainly in my mouth. And the answer is yes. Um, thank my lucky stars for that one. And I think that if I ever thought that I was getting a lesion anywhere else, I would seek treatment sooner and later. And now I know to avoid the gastroenterologist and the dentist and go straight to the dermatologist and being prepared for another complete physical exam. Yes? I was in my senior academic office, No.
not really notice, um, but when I'm about to get a lesion, and I, how do you say this right, right? Like I know I'm supposed to be avoiding things with tannin and all patients do exactly what they're supposed to do, right? Um, I still love salsa and my jalapenos and all the spicy stuff. And I notice that when I'm about to get a lesion, uh, that things are exceptionally spicy and hot. And things that I can, like, like I eat a, mash, or a baked potato with salsa on it, and it's the same salsa every time, right? But I notice that when I'm getting a lesion, I can't eat it because it's too hot. Um, you asked if it's too hot just in that one area. Um, sometimes, sometimes I'll be like, ooh, like, and I think maybe it's a seed and it's not. Um, other times it's spicy throughout my whole mouth because my whole mouth is just inflamed. Yes? Um, we all. <laughs> She, I initially got prescribed, I think, about 240 mLs, and when she refilled it, I don't even think I got 45. And I, she promised, made me promise her that I would only swab it on with um, a Q-tip. And let's face it, I lied, and I switched. And so I didn't really have enough to do much of anything. Yes, back in the red. He asked what was the most difficult um, part. That's a little tough. Um, it, it's, I, I can't say how you handle it. I can just say that um, you love somebody so much and when you're seeing them hurt, you just stick it out and try to be as supportive as you can. I mean. I was going to take care of her no matter what. And that's all I can say about it. Um, from my perspective, when I thought I had AIDS and when I finally came to, to grips with that, um, I told him, I don't know how to tell you this, but I think I have AIDS. And if at any point during this marriage that this gets to be too much, you can walk and I will have no resentments. And that's when he said he's going nowhere that he said that he was for better or worse in sickness and health, and he was going nowhere. I can also tell you that he was very supportive, especially during the days when I told him, you're gonna do nothing right, and I'm just angry, and I wanna run a marathon and sleep at the same time, <laughs> right? Because that's what prednisone will do to you, I'm telling you, nobody believes this. And he stayed there with me, and he would hold me, he would let me pull away from him, and he knew this really wasn't me. Yeah, in the back. Ah, uh, wow. I don't know. That's a good question. At that time, I had pretty good insurance. And um, little known fact to anybody outside of this room, and my husband and I, um, we thought we wanted to take about six months to a year to get to know one, of e know one another. Um, and being married, after all, I was... 32 when we got married and he was 39 pushing 40. And so we'd lived a long time by ourselves and we knew that, like again, my eggs aren't getting any younger and we wanted to get pregnant. So I was actually double covered at that time. I had my insurance as well as his. Um, I don't know. I know our co-pays were a lot. I know that for one thing, I, and it was, funky how it happened, but my copay for one test ended up being about $1,800. Um, I had bone density scans before they allowed me to start treatment um, for any on the prednisone or the Celsept. I was going for weekly blood draw so they could monitor my white count level to make sure I wasn't opening myself up for any infections. I can't imagine that immunofluorescent and the other pathology tests were very cheap. <laughs> Um, not to mention all my doctor's visits, and I guess all I can say is thank God I had insurance. But I would say maybe around three to five thousand, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? How long did your dentist get to the point before you 
Um, just the average appointment. I just had a normal appointment. Yeah, well, I just thought this was something little, and I could just tell her, and boom, and we'd be done. And then, it, um, as it turns out, like I, she just told me I needed to brush more. And even though I was brushing seven times a day because of these Invisaligns, and eventually even more than that, because I would just brush to brush, um, it was just a normal appointment. And after, I, by the way, after I was diagnosed and I told her and I came back and told her it wasn't something idiopathic, it was something immunologic, she told me, yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> no, there, she, there's a lot of, if she, if she ever said she was sorry, and she, she does say she's sorry, but it's usually before an oops or after an oops. It's usually like, oops, sorry. Like it's not. No, no, and I had even asked her, like I said, if I should see a periodontist or an ENT doctor. So, so I guess that's a, another lesson, apologize, right? Thank you, yeah, well, thank you.